This is part three in our series on value and light form. In this video, we're going to be reviewing what we've discussed so far. We're going to talk about more complex uh, interplay between objects. And then we're going to transition into uh, barge plates and then into a quick section on cast drawing so that all of the things that we've learned in theory really start to hit home. So by now you should be familiar with how light works with form and uh, all of those things that you need to know in order to make your two-dimensional drawings look more three-dimensional. In this simple still life, uh, our value sphere has all of the classic features we spoke about before, uh, incident light, highlight, and then a slow, slow change from light world into shadow world. In this case, though, we've added another object, and we now have these interplays of, of shadow effects and light effects. So um, where before we were just seeing light bouncing up off the table surface onto the base of the sphere, we now have this side of the cylinder, again, acting like a dull light source, illuminating the upper area in the sphere. But you see the same characteristics in both cases. You have incident light here, a highlight, and then this slow change, very, very slow change that becomes more and more rapid as you get to the tangent or the terminator or the uh, shadow core. And you see the exact same pattern of effects in the cylinder. So incident light, uh, more, of, more of a linear uh, highlight here, and then a slow change to shadow core. Also notice, and we're getting really deep into things here, that if you look at the shadow core, the shape and the configuration of the shadow core, the speed with which the shadow core goes from light world to core is faster than shadow core to shadow world. This side of the shadow core is a slower transition. And again, uh, this little uh, microcosm, this little light and shadow universe, uh, has all of the stuff that we really need to key in on to make things look real. Um, especially you see in the shadow here, the shadow starts very, very sharp and crisp, then gets softer and softer. You can see that same effect here, the nearer surface of the cylinder that uh, the sphere is casting shadow on is sharper here, and becomes more diffuse as it gets farther away and wraps around the cylinder. These are the things that our eye sees and our brain sees, but we really don't hold on to unless our eyes are trained because it's not really vital information. This is all a great example of the, uh, the idea that you can't just draw what your eye sees because you, your eye just wants to see this as all one light area. It isn't. There is a constant change of value from here to there. That's what makes it look real. And so uh, we almost have to overstate these changes. We really have to squeeze our values, especially in this middle area. And the more you do that, the more real your drawings will look on the page. Here's a quick history about barge plates. Charles Barge's Cours de Design, or drawing course, is one of the most influential classical drawing courses. Conceived in collaboration with Jean-Léon Jérôme, one of my favorite painters of all time. The course, published between 1866 and 1871, comprised 197 lithographs printed as individual sheets and was uh, designed to guide students from plaster casts to the study of great master drawings and finally to drawing from the living model. Among the artists uh, whose training was based on the study of Barge's plates are Pablo Picasso, whose torso after Barge is seen here, and Vincent van Gogh, who copied the complete set in 1880 1881, and at least part of it again in 1890, here we see the barge plate that uh, influences uh, Van Gogh's later drawing 
um, which turned into a painting called Worn Out. Van Gogh, uh, seen on the left-hand side here in 1873, actually worked for Maison Goupel, the uh, Barge Courses publisher, and also in their gallery for a while. In what would have been a great ad for the manual, Van Gogh wrote to his younger brother Theo in 1881, careful study and the constant and repeated copying of Barge's exercises have given me an insight into figure drawing. I have learned to measure and to see and to look for the broad outlines so that, thank God, what seemed utterly impossible to me before is gradually becoming possible now. I no longer stand as helpless before nature as I used to do. And so here's one of the barge drawings that I sent you, uh, which I've printed out. And here on the left is my copy. Um, so understand you can do both the line and the tone version, or you can just do the tone version, but the line version is kind of the skeleton. It's the under drawing underneath this more finished drawing. You can also see that uh, to the left here, I've printed out the examples we were just working on in the uh, little simple still life, just to remind myself um, about light form and how this arm image here is really a combination of, of cylinders and spheres. And so to get from here to there, to my finished copy. Here are the steps that I took. We've discussed that the very first step in doing any drawing is what's referred to as an envelope. Uh, about five lines, straight lines, that really encompass the entire drawing. And then within that envelope, we start making these divisions, um, horizontals, vertical divisions. We take measurements of width and height, transfer those over, and then within those coordinates, and you can see here that I've got kind of a vertical and a horizontal axis. That's like a miniature version of the grids that we've been using, and they're really helpful in terms of, of organizing your page and making really good decisions as to where things fall. So it's really important, even though these are pretty simple forms, to really take your time transferring and correcting these measurements. Like I said before, it's like a process of taking step by step by step to get closer and closer and closer to a bullseye if you were playing darts. Every step you take closer makes your final throw to the dartboard much more likely to be right on target. So I've really taken my time with all of these forms. I've really measured them. I've measured them against each other. Uh, and in this case, I really wanted to be super accurate. So I've actually used this uh, really nice uh, machinist or, or drafting divider to transfer some of these measurements from the original to my copies. But really, if you're careful, just anything will do. And then, in order to get really convincing tonalities, to get these forms to really turn in a convincing way, I've referred back to my value cylinder and value sphere just to give myself an idea of what typically happens when light strikes a form. Uh, and in fact, in this case, um, I've, I've actually added a little bit more uh, reflected light because in the barge copy that's just kind of all filled in. But you can you can bring these drawings to even a higher level than where they started. Once you've done some barge drawings, uh, the next easy step up is to work with cast drawings or even photographs of casts. Optimally we would be working in a classroom drawing this cast from life, but even in this photograph you can see all of the stuff that we've talked about going back to the beginning about light fall and light form and all of those classic things that light does against pure form. Um, 
here we get a little bit deeper into the game and we can start talking about shapes that have a slow radius, shapes that have a faster radius here, uh, and then shapes that have a really slow radius in this uh, chin sort of area. This, by the way, is an actual size, very accurate cast of uh, Michelangelo's David's mouth. Uh, it's from a studio in uh, Woburn, Mass, called uh, Caproni Studios. Anyway, you can see all of those same classic things happening in this cast that we've been talking about. The, the precise character of cast shadows, shadow core, and reflected light under here. You can see we've put a foam core panel underneath the cast to, so we get some reflected light. It's really helpful whether you're working from uh, a plaster cast right in front of you or even from a photograph to really think about what's happening with these with these forms. And again, I'm going to use this little square magnified out of our disco ball to kind of illustrate things. So if, uh, if any of these forms are in shadow, they're really closed off from the light. Uh, if they're in the light world, they're either hit very, very directly, like this ridge here on the, uh, above the uh, lip. And as these forms r rotate away from the light and then back again and then away and back again, you can almost tell yourself the story of what's happening with these forms. So there's the most light is here because it's also closest to the light source. But think of these forms just kind of rising up to scoop up more light or, or falling away to accept less light and then scooping back into the light again and then rolling away. Um, it's helpful to think of uh, snow falling. Think of this as being a sculpture outdoors and uh, the finest, most microcellular form of snow you've ever seen coming straight down. How would it land on this form? What, uh, what, which of these surfaces would catch that snow? Which of these surfaces would avoid it? And, and in, in what proportion? That's a helpful way to think about light striking form. And so, this is your next step after barge drawing. 